The LA fires have been raging for over a week now, and I've been thinking about this nonstop. And as reports have started to surface that some people were actually able to save their houses, it got me thinking about a lot of the types of things that I would do in the future to be prepared living here in San Diego. So let's see what we could learn about building houses and retroactive or proactive things that you can do to be better prepared for fires in the future. I'm Ricky, and this is Tuba Da Vinci. So first and foremost, the heroes in the front lines are firefighters, rescue operators, all the people, all the paramedics, and everybody else. Thank you so much for what you guys are doing. It's amazing seeing how much other countries have come together, Cal Fire, other states even, Texas, Idaho, other places, Oregon. Thank you guys for all that you guys have been doing, and I'm hoping that we can put this fire out soon. It is starting to turn that way. But let's start with... What we could do as homeowners or as renters, what we could do to be better prepared for fires, because I'll be the first to tell you, I've been having trouble sleeping. I've been thinking about this nonstop since this happened. I'm about 140 miles away here in San Diego, and I've been thinking about this and what I would do, because again, we as parents, we think about being prepared and how we would never forgive ourselves, right? Let's start with the basics of things that we can all learn from, from good building design. There was an architect named Greg Chasen who showed that some of the houses that he had designed had actually survived. This is one of his builds, and you can see that while his neighbor's house is almost entirely burned down, car caught fire, there's uh, just destruction kind of everywhere, but this house survived. I wanted to show you kind of what we're up against. These are embers recorded on a, on a ring camera doorbell. And you can see the size of some of these embers. And as high, strong winds are carrying them around, this is one of the things that can spark fires in remote areas. As these embers land on something, what are the odds that that then ignites, right? If you land on concrete like these here, they're going to sit there and slowly extinguish and not cause any further problems. But other stuff, if it lands on growth or wood or anything else that is combustible, we have ourselves a bit of a problem. Let's talk about some of the building materials at play. This actually appears to be wood. So here in the front as a visual thing, an architectural showcase, they have used wood. But if you see, it's kind of recessed here behind all of this. And all of this is stucco. So the siding of the entire house has stucco, which is still timber framing. It's wood framing. But then it has a inch to two inch thick basically concrete wall around it. And this is far more fire resilient than like wood siding would be. The next thing is actually this divide that he has. This is a cinder brick wall. And it's not even that tall. It's under six feet. But you can see how much heat it has taken coming off of this car. And it just stopped it right there in its tracks. Now, these are basically fire breaks. These are the sorts of things that we could consider when building houses. I want to show you one more picture. This is like in the broad daylight here. And if you look at this picture, what you see here running off of this one, that's aluminum. That is melted aluminum. Aluminum melts probably around 1200 degrees. So that means we were seeing temperatures up in that range and still nothing around here burned now one thing that some of the commenters mentioned is that this looks like wood but it's actually a metal roofing so it kind of mimics panels while being steel again a hugely beneficial thing if you look here very minimal eaves this is a problem that i have my eaves are all 18 inches plus these are all pretty small here in southern california we don't really have much rain so that wasn't really much of a consideration metal gutters, and just everything else that could be taken to minimize the amount of, of potential fire hazard. It's hard to know what they had here in terms of growth and stuff, but you can see that there's a lot of hardscape inside and out. Even around here, this is all rock chips, right? So there are a couple of little shrubs in these little pop-outs, but it is largely hardscape. That rock would never melt, and you would be able to have embers land and, and, and extinguish without causing further fires. So just to drive this point home, take a look at this. This is a little video that I found on Cal Fire's YouTube channel, and they do a little control burn along this wood chip. And you can see this house has wood chips all the way to the boundary. And here there's actually hardscape. There's some stone, looks like a walking path. And the chips end there. And you can see here the fire has kind of run its course. The wood chips have burned. But here, look at how quickly it takes on the house. There's also a wooden fence, which is completely combustible. 
Uh, there's these eaves, right? The heat, the fire comes in and kind of gets trapped up in this area. And it looks like probably wooden siding, but this entire structure catches fire and it's completely burnt down. The only reason why it's still standing is the two by fours, which are thicker, just have more mass and require longer to burn down. But I mean, this is a complete loss here at this point. And just look over here. This isn't advanced building materials or anything. This is the most amazing example because this actually is not that expensive to change. This siding is wood, just like this one was. This was all the same. Now, they had a metal fence here, right? So this is an iron fence that didn't burn at all. The wood, you can see how quickly that took. This is something that we could probably all do right now. So the first advice that I would have is designate a five foot barrier to your house, five feet off of your property, like where your house ends and have no wood chips. I honestly don't think in Southern California or anywhere prone to fires that wood chip should ever be used. Actually, I just, I think we have to move past that. I know the brown looks cool, but stone comes in different colors. We're going to have to just basically get rid of that and go to a hardscape because again, stone at worst at many, many multiples in terms of temperature would melt, but it would never combust the way organic material would. So what we could do is get rid of all the, all the wood chips and go hardscape. And within a five foot boundary, try to get rid of plants and stuff. I'm guilty of this across the front of my house. For example, we have some shrubs and, and stuff that I'm going to rip out. And what we're thinking is we rip it out, completely do concrete or pavers, something like that. And then maybe we can just have like a concrete raised bed. Again, not a wooden raised bed. I'd, I'd go concrete, poured raised bed, and then just have a couple of little plants and, and still have a little bit of a boundary. If we go back to that architectural house, you could just kind of see how much of a fire break this is. And now in terms of more expensive retrofits and stuff, yeah, I actually have a lot of vinyl fence that I'm going to rip out, I think, especially uphill because if a fire were to come down upon us, I would love to have a break there, right? Because the fire would hit that cinder, that cinder block, the concrete, and just burn along any biomass along there until it had nothing left and then just extinguish instead of continuing to roll downhill. This is going to be really expensive. I haven't gotten quotes and stuff, but I'm imagining, I don't know, like 20 grand, right? For me, it's worth it for that extra peace of mind. So I have a lot of vinyl fencing right now, and I now think that that has to go. Let me show you why. This is a little test done by the Hardy Board Company. So this is Hardy Fiber Boards. And I just want to show you kind of their test setup. They have little flame torches that they run for a little period of time. You can kind of see here. They turn on the nozzles, and you can kind of see the fire start to spread, right? So look at this. The vinyl is the first to go. Vinyl is basically like a plastic and it just in two minutes has already completely given up. So our fence that we have now that's vinyl would be quick to just ignite. Then we have cedar, which is like a natural wood material. Again, it's already charring and burning and it's only been two minutes. The engineered wood, which is a category which is uh, typically either petroleum based or like a, like a hybrid blend of different things is already going as well. And then finally over here is a fiber cement board. Again, more inorganic material, and you can see the damage. So if we fast forward here in time, you can see how quickly the other things have already given way, and the other structures have already kind of failed. And this is the end damage to the hardy cement board. That's a pretty telling story, I think, of, of how important the materials are. And I'll be honest, I'd, I've never thought about the material so much before. It was For me, I was like, oh, what looks really aesthetic? Or how much does that cost? How much is that? And then I'd make choices that way. But basically, our house is currently stucco. We have this big two-inch thick barrier that I'm very glad we have. But there are a few areas where we have like a OSB-based siding, probably like in the engineered category or or worse. And I think it would go up really quickly. So we're going to slowly take our time and replace them all. We're also going to enforce that five foot boundary across everything. Too bad if some plants have to get pulled out. Uh, it's a heartbreaking thing to do. It sucks, but priorities have to be about fire prevention for us. And um, that's going to be one of the things that we do. Before I get into some of the more higher tech approaches, I want to show you some of the most amazing stories I've, I've come across. Like this elderly couple stayed against the evacuation mandate 
and just fought the fire with garden hoses. So they stayed back and they used garden hoses and, and tried to fight the fire. And the decision that they made was that life would be, it would either, you know, there, a captain goes down with his ship, basically, that they were going to make this the last stand and they didn't want to live if they meant losing their home. They've been here for a long time. They've been renovating it. Like, this is home, basically. They called it heaven on earth. For anybody who's been in Southern California, I completely understand the Palisades are just a gorgeous area, and she didn't leave. And there's a, there's a couple of other stories like that as well. There was another gentleman who, who fought the fires using a hose from a pool. And we're going to get into this story here. This is something that's pretty interesting as well. But he saw that one of the neighbors had a pool, put a hose into it, ran a diesel or a gas water pump, and just started evac extinguishing fires all around, not just his property, but around his neighborhood. So obviously, it's, a, it's, it's powerful to, to just stay and fight. Those are decisions that we're all going to have to make for ourselves. We live in a free country. Um, these are values and questions that you have to take and, and answer. I honestly have thought about it. I don't know what I would do. Uh, for sure, I would take my wife and my kids away. I don't know what I would do personally, but check out this one. In Southern California also, just because of our weather, a lot of homes have pools. And so this family, had. it was basically this gentleman's father bought a system for him. It's basically, we'll show you here what it looks like. So this is it right here. It's just a little rollout, looks like a dolly basically, with a diesel or gasoline water pump and a one inch big fire hose. And it was able to be rolled out, set up into the pool and just fight fires. And they actually showed how they'd used it in the past. And here, here's a little shot of just how much pressure you could develop with it. And they kept the mountains wet and kept the fires from advancing in this direction. Now, I bring up this example because other people who are using garden hoses or turning on sprinklers, um, obviously you can never know what someone's going to do in that moment. But the question with that is we are all using the same water supply. So if hundreds or thousands of homes started to do that, we would potentially lose water. And you got to remember that the fire hydrants that the firefighters use run on the same systems. But if you have a pool, that one's obvious. One of the first things we're going to do is we're going to add a bypass valve for our pool. We have a pool. We have pool pumps already there, right? And because we have battery backup as well, even if we lost power, we probably have a lot of energy to be able to run these pumps for five or six hours at the least. So for that reason, step one would be I'm going to take the pool pumps that normally bring the water through the filter and out and add a little bypass valve that I keep shut off for the most part. But maybe take that. <clears throat> and allow it to be connected to a hose to be able to drain our pool in the event of a fire. But the one thing I know that we should probably all do is think of how we can do this. If there is any sort of fire and you have a pool, your pool should be drained. At the very least, we should take whatever water you have in your pool and we should discharge that because that water is not coming from the city. It doesn't take from firefighting re uh, resources and it could do huge amounts of good. So just a really quick look on Amazon as a as a guide, because I wasn't really sure what something like this would cost. But looking like maybe 600 400 in that realm, not unreasonable. You could have one of these in the garage, have some fuel on hand if, you know, gasoline and, and oil and stuff and keep it serviced and ready and have it that you could pull it out in the event of a fire, bring it up and discharge the contents of your pool. The one thing about fire is that's uncommon or unlike other uh, disasters, is there is no me versus you. It is very much a communal thing. If you have the most fireproof house ever built, but you're surrounded by neighbors who haven't taken the same precautions, then you're going to be kind of in trouble. And the same is also true for water. If you're just spraying water all around at neighbors and your house and everything else and just add to the moisture in the area, that could potentially save homes even beyond you. In some of the stories that I've heard, their neighbors came and thanked them for saving their houses too because they weren't around and they thought they lost it, but because some of the actions taken, it helped. Finally, I was researching like how much further or, or what else we could do. Here's an example of, of, a, of a homeowner who basically ran PVC you know, sprinkler lines up to the roof and actually have rotating sprinkler heads. Now this I think is actually pretty clever because by only having three sprinkler heads or at least two, maybe one over here as well, he's able to cover quite a bit. 
the the mistake a lot of people make when it comes to irrigation is having a lot of heads that just ex, like displace water so much that you lose pressure. That's why we have these different zones in our systems. But a head like this that can rotate 360 and look at the reach. Let me just see how far this water is going can have some really huge impacts. There were reports that people had systems like this, turned them on, and then evacuated. And they came back and their homes were still standing. So that got me thinking, what about in terms of like whole home solutions? Is there a company offering something like that? And there is. And you can see here's a system. It's called Frontline. And look at this. There's there's tanks. And this tank down here is actually fire suppressant. And then there's like control boxes. The water goes through here. It gets piped up through copper. They're, they're using copper, interestingly. And it has heads, as you can see. And based on what they detect, if they detect fire at some sensors, they can engage the sprinkler systems and turn them on. And this is a really automated system. Like you could not even be home and have these trigger. They mentioned that it costs about $10 per square foot. So if you have a 2,000 square foot house, about $20,000. So for us, maybe 30... 30,000 or so, but some of the stuff you could potentially accomplish on your own without too much trouble, but this would be the high end. So if you didn't want to do anything yourself, you wanted to automate it by built by professionals, there are companies like Frontline Wildfire Defense who can come out and install a system for you. And this again, just increases the level of saturation, the moisture in the area and can help control fires and, and save your house. And I've been thinking about this and seeing if it's worth it or not. A lot of these things cost money, right? To change all your siding, that is that is no small feat. It's a huge undertaking, right? A system like this is not cheap either. I've been thinking about this and I wanted to kind of share some of the options that are available and what some people are doing and the kind of levels of success that they've had. So for me, I'm thinking about doing something like this, but myself, maybe in the eaves of all of our uh, roof lines, having some PVC line and having sprinkler heads that we could turn on or off. Maybe we run the controllers to be able to control different zones of the house. Um, I'm still thinking about some of the design work there. By the way, the one cool thing about this frontline system, the fire suppressant, like you mentioned, that's not just water. That has that fire retardant system. It's like FOSS check or there's different chemicals that not only put out fires, but they kind of keep them from from starting even. So you could pour this out early before a fire even comes and potentially keep the fire from um, from advancing. But fire science is wildly complicated. There's a lot to it. I think I'm going to try to see if I can get in touch with Cal Fire, see if we can have like a little tribunal to learn what we could do as homeowners, like what would be helpful for them. We're not on islands, right? We're all connected. We're all together, right? That means even if you use up all the water for the entire city and all your neighbors don't have water, you're not going to be able to save your house, right? We have to work together. And that's one of the most amazing parts of this story is how people have come together in the communal interest of, of saving our lives. Um, I live not far from here and I know San Diego could be next. It could be this year, next year, whatever the case is. So I've just been thinking about this a lot. I'd love for this to be kind of a resource from other people as well. Are there strategies that you employ in other parts? I, I, I learned from a viewer in Australia, some of the things that they do with fire sprinklers and stuff uh, mounted on the roof. Let me know. I'd love to have all that information so we can share with everybody. And again, it starts small. If you have dead leaves, rake it up, leaf blow it, collect it, put it in the, in the, in the yard bins and do all that we can to help each other. And uh, hopefully this thing is a um, controlled fire soon and we don't lose any more homes and lives and stuff. All right, that's a quick look at some of the crazy ways that some people have actually saved their homes and how maybe some inspiration for what we could do, especially if you're doing any kind of remodeling. I think some of these things have to be structural to your design and aesthetic language for how you build homes. I just think we have to be building them this way. There's just too much at risk. All right. Thanks so much for watching. I'm Ricky Da Vinci. We'll catch you guys next week.